Hello AP Litton Comp students, this is Mr. Johnson and in order to prepare you for your Things Fall Apart test, I'm going to help guide you through a quick little lecture that will review a lot of the major concepts, characters, and contexts of the novel. So let's get things started first off with a discussion about Chinua Achebe. Uh, Chinua Achebe, the author of Things Fall Apart, was born in Nigeria in 1930. Um, he was raised as part of the Igbo culture within Nigeria, and he ended up studying English at University College in Nigeria. Um, after kind of switching his major a few different times, he grew to love English and writing, and that ultimately that ended up informing a lot of his future writing. Um, and he actually died in 2013, so not too long ago, at the age of 82, at the time he was teaching or he was teaching literature classes in Boston. So let's review some of the books that he wrote. Uh, so he's most known for the African Trilogy, and these are very, these are very definitive works in, when it comes to English language African fiction. So the first book in the trilogy is Things Fall Apart, the book we read, which was published in 1958. Uh, the second book was No Longer at Ease, which was published in 1960, and the final book of the trilogy is Era of God, which was published in 1964. Now, if you want to read either No Longer at Ease or Era of God, both of these titles are available in our illustrious classroom library. Um, with Chinua Achebe, he also wrote very, a large, large number of poems, short stories, and critical essays, so he was definitely a very prolific writer to the point where he actually has a lot of books coming out nowadays, af even after his death, simply because he had so much material that he wrote. So let's cover some of the context and background of Things Fall Apart next. Now, Achebe was initially inspired to write after reading Mr. Johnson by Joyce Carey while he was studying at University College. Now, this book is set in Nigeria, and it's written by a British author, but he, but Achebe really felt that the depictions of Nigerians in the novel were very insulting and harmful. Achebe believed this simply because a lot of the depictions of characters within the novel were very stereotypical. In fact, on the right side of the screen is a cover that was used for the novel, and you can see how it does have a very stereotypical racist depiction of an African man right on the cover. Um, and many believe that the African trilogy novels were kind of a direct response to Carrie and other European authors and their depictions of African cultures. Achebe wanted to create a very fully formed view of what it meant to be African, especially during times of colonialism. Now, the novel itself actually looks very critically at both European and Igbo culture. Now, Igbo culture is depicted as prizing masculinity, which ends up causing Okonkwo to develop a tragic flaw in the novel. But then at the same time, European colonialism just completely ravages and destroys a lot of the Igbo culture during the second half of the novel when white European colonists end up coming in and pushing Christianity on the Igbo culture, end up pushing colonial law and taking control of their governments. So it's definitely, so while Achebe does show the negative sides of Igbo culture, he does place a lot of his blame on European colonialism. Now, Achebe uses Igbo and European storytelling methods within the novel, and a lot of this comes from the fact that he led a very hybridized life, like he studied at a British-run college within Nigeria, but then he was firmly rooted in a lot of the Igbo culture. So the way you could see this is that there are many allusions to European works within the novel. For instance, the title of the novel, Things Fall Apart, is a reference to a poem by William Butler Yeats. And Okonkwo himself is actually modeled after classical hero archetypes, and mainly how he develops a tragic flaw. He might be a, he might be a very hard worker, he might be a very a fearsome warrior, but ultimately he has one flaw that undoes everything that he does and kind of is the source of all of his pain and conflict throughout the novel. And on the other hand, there are a lot of Igbo proverbs that are just constantly mentioned in the narrative and they are just woven so beautifully 
that it's really hard to kind of get them out of your mind. And they are very key to the narrative and understanding the Igbo beliefs and Igbo culture. Now let's talk about the settings of the novel for a little bit. So the book is set in Nigeria in the 1890s, so the turn of the 20th century. Now the first half of the novel, which is kind of shorthand for before Okonkwo gets exiled, takes place before the colonization of Nigeria and other surrounding lands by the Europeans. And then the second half of the novel, which takes place after Okonkwo's exile, takes place after the colonization by the Europeans. So you could definitely see how Achebe uses this as a, as a literary device in order to kind of explain the effects that it had, kind of a before and after of what colonialism does to Igbo culture. Now, most of the novel takes place within the Amofia tribe, which is a collection of a bunch of villages. Uh, as you could kind of see here on the map, this is where Umofia, or also known as Igbo land, kind of takes place. And eventually, at one point of the novel, Okonkwo's family is, is exiled to Banta after the accidental death of Zudu's son, which ends up kind of being the catalyst for a lot of Okonkwo's troubles. Now, let's cover the characters of the novel for a little bit. So, our main character is obviously Okonkwo. He's what he's the character that the novel follows the most, who talks about the most, who fleshes out the most. Um, he is a hard worker and a very fearsome warrior. You can see that just because of his wealth, the fact that he has three wives, the fact that he is a clansman who is very well respected for his military campaigns. But he doesn't really show much affection to his family and friends. And a lot of this stems from the fact that he is afraid of being weak like his father, Unoka. Now, this fear of failure and being seen as weak is ultimately kind of his tragic flaw in a lot of ways. That's what causes a lot of the conflicts of the novel, what causes him to act out very act out very rashly, and it causes him to clash with Igbo tradition and European colonial rule, which ultimately results in his death at the end of the novel. Now, for some more characters, we have Unoka, who is Okonkwo's father, and he's lazy, effeminate, and weak by Igbo standards, and by extension, Ok in Okonkwo's eyes. But even though he's dead, he still affects Okonkwo's actions immensely. A lot of people a lot of critics and a lot of people think that Okonkwo is very motivated by his father, even though his father is completely absent throughout the novel. And then we have uh, Okonkwo's oldest son, Woye, who, who he kind of develops different interests from Okonkwo, which leads to a lot of criticism from his father. And ultimately, he kind of questions a lot of the Igbo traditions and a lot of the customs and the power structure and then converts to Christianity once white settlers end up coming into Igbo land. And Okonkwo actually believes him to be effeminate and weak like his father, which ultimately leads to him kind of rejecting his oldest son. Next up we have Akimafuna, who is the adoptive son of Okonkwo. And, o and Okonkwo ultimately loves Akimafuna simply because he's everything that his oldest son is not. He is a very respectful clansman. He is a good warrior. And he ultimately kind of just acts like the son that Okonkwo never had. But ultimately, Okonkwo ends up killing Akimafuna because of a prophecy that the elders of the tribe end up bringing down. And in a lot of, in a lot of readings of this novel, this is where things truly fall apart for Okonkwo, simply because he wasn't supposed to kill someone who is so tied to his family, who's so tied to his culture, and someone who he loves like a son, and that's kind of a bad omen in Igbo culture. And then we have Obirka, who is Okonkwo's closest friend, and he ultimately kind of takes care of Okonkwo's assets and his land and his affairs while he's exiled in the middle of the novel. But Obirka is an important character because he... He, unlike Okonkwo, actually questions a lot of the Igbo traditions and customs and tries to integrate them as a way of compromise. He's someone who, he appreciates Igbo culture, but he does look at it very critically. So now we have a lot of the 
colonist characters here. So the first one is Mr. Brown, and he is the first white missionary to actually come to Amopia. And the thing about Mr. Brown is that he actually treats the Igbo culture very, very respectfully. And he actively attempts to compromise and work with them to the point where he's building schools for the Amophian people, he's building hospitals for them. And because of his dedication to peace and non-conflict, he ends up successfully converting a lot of Igbo culture, or a lot of Igbo people, to Christianity through his peaceful ways. But on the other hand, there's Reverend Smith, who is the white missionary who replaces Mr. Brown. And Reverend Smith, you know, to put it bluntly, is a racist, strict, xenophobic, horrible man. He's someone who he does not respect Igbo culture at all and actually actively hates it to the point where he instigates a lot of the conflict in the novel simply because he hates Igbo culture so much and he thinks it's so below him to be there that these people should be more thankful of the fact that he's giving them the gift of Christianity. Now before we review the events of the novel you might have remembered when we first started the unit I gave you a worksheet that mentioned that mentioned the timeline of the novel. And while you were reading the novel, you were supposed to be filling out a lot of the major events of the novel, a lot of the causes of conflict, and charting them out. So because you have this very comprehensive guide as to what the events of the novel are, I'm actually not going to be covering it. But I, pl but I do want you, before the test, to please review your timeline handout. This is a very useful tool to kind of understanding a lot of the a lot of the complicated plot points in order to s understand the conflict and it will definitely help you out if you take the time to review it. Now if you need any extra resources to kind of help you study for the test, my biggest suggestion is the Crash Course Literature uh, video series on Things Fall Apart, hosted by John Green, the writer of books like uh, The Fault in Our Stars and Paper Towns. And I actually really like these videos, not because they are very comprehensive, but because he does a really good job of overviewing a lot of the most important points when it comes to the novel. So if you just click John Green talking about burritos right here, then that will instantly link you to uh, the first part of his series, or you could just check in the description of the video to find a link to both videos. Now for your assignment. Now for review, you're actually going to complete a crossword puzzle. Now this will definitely help you out on the test because it kind of quizzes you on a lot of the things that we're going to cover on the test and it quizzes you on a lot of the content that was that I talked about in this lecture. Now, if you are unable to print a copy of the crossword puzzle to bring the class, please make sure you're writing down your answers on a separate sheet of paper. I'm going to have some extra copies of the crossword puzzle, and I'll give you some time in class to, you know, finish them up if you didn't get them all completed, and then we're going to review them all as a group. But please make sure you do most of your work before you come to class. We will be turning in this crossword puzzle for a formative assessment grade, so please be sure to come prepared. Now, if you want to click on here on the video, if you're watching on your YouTube channel, it will actually link you to the crossword puzzle that you're going to have to print off. So all you have to do is print it off and download it and then fill it out according to the directions. Um, the clues are here on the bottom and the puzzle itself. Please be sure to write your name on it. And I'm looking forward to seeing what all you guys have done. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Otherwise, good luck.